Hey y'all, Data Guy here. And today, what I wanna do is, you know, kind of in keeping with something I've been getting asked a lot in comments recently is more comparison videos. And today, what I wanna do is do a really focused comparison video on some of the most popular NoSQL databases that I see out there being used. There are a ton of NoSQL databases, that's why I kind of brought this uh, graphic up. But today, the ones I wanna specifically talk about are MongoDB, Apache Cassandra, and Redis. Um, because I think those kind of give you the different flavors of NoSQL databases pretty well. Um, and then, you know, there's obviously more options in the market. So if you want to see me talk about those options, drop them in the comments below and I'll make a follow up video for this. Uh, without further ado, going to get into talking about, hey, what, or how do each of these work? What are the pros and cons of each of these? And then give you a framework for deciding which one is appropriate for your specific use case, because there's no one size fits all approach. Um, so without further ado, let's get started with MongoDB. So MongoDB is really popular uh, to an IPO that I want to say two, three years ago. Um, and obviously it's been really successful at being a document oriented NoSQL database that stores data in flexible JSON-like BSON, which they call binary JSON formats. Um, and so each record in this format contains key value pairs, and then you have collections or groupings of these data of these documents um, that serve as the database's core structure. So MongoDB is a series of collections, uh, each containing many documents. Um, and this kind of schemaless approach where you're just horizontally adding on additional collections as you need more uh, storage capacity, make it popular for applications that require rapid iteration and adaption because you can have completely different key value pairs in different documents um, and still be able to store them all in the same location because each document exists as its own entity. Um, but you still can organize them um, into different groupings, make it easy to query. Um, and then Mongo has a bunch of other tools to actually help you manage that as well. Um, and so just kind of summarize all that. You have documents that contain the actual data and key value pairs, collections, group those documents together. And then the features kind of Mongo adds on top of it are automatic sharding, which you're seeing here, high availability through replica sets and horizontal scaling of many different collections. Um, and then you query this using a JSON-based query language, so a custom query language built for MongoDB that also supports powerful indexing mechanisms to help optimize query performance. And some of the pros of this approach are number one, flexibility. Uh, schemaless design means that data can evolve without requiring migrations or schema changes. If you change a format of your data, you don't need to retroactively change the format of all of your existing data. Uh, and it also has a JSON-like structure, so that means natural compatibility with modern applications that use JSON or similar data formats. Additionally, that horizontal sharding really allows your database to score, scale horizontally across multiple servers super easily without really needing to pre-plan capacity. You can just keep slapping on additional servers. Um, and then finally, as a really popular tool, it's got a really strong ecosystem, massive community, tons of different integrations and plugins that you can that allow you to extend it to use with different other various tools and platforms. On the con side, MongoDB operates under an eventual consistency model where in, dis in distributed setups, unless it's configured for strict consistency, so having consistency across all of your different shards or nodes isn't necessarily guaranteed at a particular point in time. Eventually, it will try to con uh, store your data consistently, but MongoDB shouldn't be used for use cases where you need really strict atomic data um, and no duplication. Additionally, you have right performance overhead, um, kind of the flexibility of BSON and then also the querying language they built on top of it to make all of these different disparate documents accessible can result in some performance head during more intensive write operations. So something to keep in mind if your use case is particularly write heavy, MongoDB might not be the best solution for you. Um, and then also it's pretty resource intensive. Um, so in really large deployments, because you're just slapping on additional servers, it's not super well optimized. Um, so it can start to just chug up and consume a lot of uh, your money. And so use cases MongoDB is ideal for is where you have data that's semi-structured, schema evolution is expected. You don't have a clear vi vision of how your schema is gonna change and evolve over time, but you know it's going to. Um, and also where JSON is the primary data format, Otherwise, it's going to be really hard getting data into MongoDB because you're going to have to convert it in JSON format before bringing it into Mongo, and it's just kind of useless steps there. Um, and then also, the application demands really high scalability with flexible data models. So if you need to ha have the ability to scale up really quickly without pre-planning, MongoDB is probably a good option for you. 
Um, so that's kind of MongoDB in a nutshell. So now moving on to Redis. Now, the next NoSQL database I want to talk about is Redis. Now, Redis stands for Remote Dictionary Server, which is an in-memory key value store that is classified as a NoSQL database, but some people like it picky and not technically classified as, but I wanted to include it in here because it is very distinct from how Mongo or Cassandra works, but is also has a lot of the same properties as NoSQL databases do. Um, and it supports a wide variety of data structures, so strings, lists, sets, sorted lists, hashes, and it's really designed for ultra fast, low latency operations where you need to constantly and quickly access a, a smaller portion of your overall data that you're reading and writing to. Um, and really good choice for applications that need a lot of caching, as you can kind of see in this example, and I'll talk about in a second, and also real-time applications where you need to be constantly reading and, reading and writing data. And so how Redis kind of core differentiates from other providers is Redis doesn't really act as your primary store. Um, instead, it acts as a cache or a temporary store for the most commonly used data. So data that you need to constantly pull from or write to. Um, and then if that data doesn't exist in, in a proper setup that should only be like, you know, 10% of use cases, then it can request data from a backing NoSQL database. Um, but Redis itself is really a cache. And how it works is Redis will score, store its data primarily in memory. It offers some persistence features like periodic snapshotting and append-only file logging. Um, and these data structures also enable pretty versatile operations, having it just in memory in a pretty unconstrained format. It lets you do things like string operations, directly storing and manipulating text or binary data within the data store, um, doing things like lists, set, hashes, those kind, different kinds of data, managing them um, with insertion, deletion, and range queries. And then also uh, for pub sub messaging use cases. Redis can function as a message broker, um, similar to how Google pub sub operates and transit really commonly used messages between a backend database and whatever application is kind of serving as the front end for your overall data system. Um, and then data is accessed by keys, which can also be manually assigned and Redis supports atomic operations. So it's really suitable for high performance use cases. Some pros to this approach are, number one, Redis is incredibly fast due to its in-memory nature. So it's able to achieve response times and serve data back in the microsecond range if it exists in cache. And then also those rich data structures I mentioned before, Redis supports various data types, many different data types, a lot more flexible than MongoDB. So it's suitable for a wide range of real-time processing use cases. And then also atomic operations. It has built-in support for atomicity, so you can ensure high reliability in the transactions you're performing. And then you also have optional persistence mechanisms for better durability. Its primary strength is gonna be in fast ephemeral data access, but you do have some options to kind of bridge the gap between ephemeral data service and the more persistent kind of tracking of historical data. Now, cons on this side are number one because it is so memory dependent it's an you know in memory database it's going to require a ton of ram to store data and so while it can offload data to disk and you know that's what you're seeing here offloading it to a back-end database performance degrades pretty significantly for data that it has to offload it also has pretty limited querying capabilities it's very much optimized for key value access so querying or searching based on values especially compared to something like MongoDB, is a lot more limited. So it's not something you're gonna to wanna to be actively reading from too much. Um, and that, or at least reading from it in large formats. Uh, obviously you're gonna be reading a lot of data from Redis, um, but compounding that is that it's not ideal for large data sets because of that memory based nature. It's not gonna be really well suited for handling massive, you know, 10, 20, 30 gigabyte data sets, um, unless it's used for specific data subsets of a larger data set. Um, and so use cases Redis excels in are cases where high speed data access is critical. So caching layers, real time analytics, leaderboard systems uh, for you know, things like games. And then you also have applications that require simple key value access with a variety of data structures. So session management or message brokering. Um, and then finally, any use case where really high scalability and low latency performance are paramount uh, to achieving that particular use case. So that's Redis. Now, finally, on to Apache Cassandra, the Apache entrant in this space. So Apache Cassandra, obviously part of the Apache Foundation open source. 
um, is a distributed wide column store NoSQL database that's designed for handling massive amounts of structured data across multiple different data centers and the cloud and offers high availability with no single point of failure and it's optimized for write heavy workloads and really large scale deployments. Um, and how it works is Cassandra's architecture, and you can kind of see an example where you have many different nodes here, it's based on a Dynamo inspired distribution model and big table inspired data model which features partitioned rows, tunable consistency, decentralized architecture, and scalability. So first, partitioned rows. What that means is data is stored in rows, which are then organized into partitions, and then those partitions are actually distributed across nodes in a cluster using consistent hashing to make sure each node has an equal share of that load. It also has tunable consistency. So users can configure Cassandra to either prioritize really strong consistency and make sure that if any one of these nodes gets updated, all of them get updated immediately, or eventual consistency where one of these nodes gets updated and eventually, you know, at some point in time in the future, all of these nodes will eventually get to the same state. Um, and you can configure to choose either of those based on what your application needs. Obviously, you know, strong consistency is gonna be quite more performance intensive, um, but sometimes you need it. And then also underpinning all this, that decentralized architecture. So each node in Cassandra is identical, and that contributes to a really highly available and fault tolerant system without master nodes and those single point of failures. Each node handles an equal share of that load and they're all identical. Um, and also as a result of this too, provides really linear scalability where you can just keep adding on nodes and increase capacity very seamlessly. Um, and some pros to this approach are, number one, scalability. Cassandra scales horizontally with ease, making it really well suited for large distributed systems with massive data requirements. It's also got fault tolerance. Data is replicated across nodes and even data centers, making sure there's no one single point of failure. And it also has really high write performance. Cassandra is optimized for high write, for write heavy applications with low latency writes. It has a tunable consistency, as I mentioned earlier, where you can tr configure that trade off between consistency, availability, and performance. Now, all of these great things don't come without any cons, um, and Cassandra has a few. So number one is complexity and querying. Cassandra's query model is limited to compared to document-based or relational databases, and querying data uh, is gonna require a really careful schema design up front because you're needing to query across all of these different nodes. Um, and it also has a lot of overhead for small deployments. This is meant for really, really large terabyte scale applications. For small scale applications, Cassandra's distributed in nature can introduce unnecessary complexity and overhead compared to just you know using other uh, database types, um, or you, know, you don't need to have a Ferrari to you know drive to the store, right? As is kind of a good analogy there. Um, and finally, learning curve setting all this up is no easy task. Um, and Cassandra's unique data model and architecture require a pretty steep learning curve if you haven't used any kind of wide column store or distributed systems before. Um, so if you're looking at Cassandra probably you're going to want to have some experience or a willingness to learn all that. Um, and then finally, for use cases, Cassandra is really best suited for use cases that where large scale distributed applications with massive data sets and a need for high availability, being able to access that data at any time. Um, also, use cases that prioritize write performance, so things like time series data, logging, IoT data collection, um, and then also applications that require multi data center support and fault tolerance. Um, so that's really all I got for you today. I just wanted to break down these three seemingly similar database types and really show you how different they are and the different use cases that are best, best suited for. So I hope this video has been helpful. I hope you've learned something and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Data guy out.